Well, I'm currently Executive Vice President of the Information Systems and Technology Group in General Dynamics. Uh, it's one of four groups. It's about $12 billion in revenue, primarily uh, selling defense uh, and military equipment around the world to uh, not only U.S., but international customers, and about 10 percent of the business is commercial. Well, the topic of the conference is strategic agility, and what I uh, intend to speak about is take uh, the basic components of strategic agility, which I think uh, boil down to really three, three concepts. Having a keen sense of one's market, competition, the environment, the trends, technologies, uh, and your portfolio position. Couple that with having the fluidity of resources, both financial and human capital, to take action. And then thirdly, with organizational alignment, so that whatever action you want to take uh, or whatever uh, management philosophies you have are, are implemented fully at all echelons, put them together and see how those have been applied uh, over the last 50 to 60 years in the defense industry. And no surprise, uh, being a member of the industry for 30 plus years now, that's what I've chosen. Secondly, uh, I will use some examples primarily from General Dynamics and try and illustrate in up cycles and down cycles, how those uh, concepts of strategic agility have been used to success, and some have not been so successful, and maybe examine why. Uh, we'll use some other examples of other corporations as well, but in particular, um, we chose the last 60 years of the defense industry because it has some very defined cycles, uh, at least three or four major upturns and downturns. So I think it provides a good laboratory to examine corporate behavior and, and what works and what doesn't. First, you see different players take a different position, uh, depending on whether or not they determine it's a structural change or it's simply a cyclical change. And let me illustrate uh, an example of both. In the late 40s, after World War II, uh, or up until the time of uh, World War II, this nation pulled together an army and a force to protect its natural interest or project its uh, forces around the world when it felt threatened or when it had an action uh, in the Philippines, wherever. After that war, basically that arsenal was and the forces were uh, drawn down, and defense budget and defense spending went down tremendously. This even occurred all the way through World War II, uh, World War I, rather, where after World War I, we geared up, then there was a huge drawdown in forces, a reduction in spending, and we went into kind of an isolationist policy. Post-World War II, with the Cold War, mutual deterrence, uh, Russia as the, uh, the other pending superpower, uh, there was a structural change. And we now kept a standing defense industry, later became uh, referred to as the defense industrial complex. Some see that as a positive, some see that as a negative. It's not for us to examine that, but it existed. So there's a structural change now. There's a new threshold in that market. At that point, um, electric boat, which had been supplying submarines, patrol boats, marine engines, uh, since maybe 1899 to the defense uh, firm, saw an opportunity to create additional value by expanding in that market because there was going to be a new threshold. And so they grew the business and they expanded into other lines that uh, would have application to that mission. So there was an opportunity to create value and grow uh, in the defense market because there was a structural change. Uh, there have been other cycles. Post World War II, there was less spending, but it wasn't going to go down as far. Then there's an up cycle when we had the threat in Korea. Similarly, Vietnam, Bay of Pigs, uh, the Reagan buildup, um, and then more recently with Iraq and Afghanistan. So some of these uh, cycles teach us a definitive lessons. Some of them are as what happens in a down cycle. Well, applying the strategic agility, if you don't have all three components, it's difficult to be a success. What do I mean by that? Um, for instance, in the, uh, in the late 50s, with the down cycle of the 50s, General Dynamics said, well, the cycle's going down. How do I continue to grow and build shareholder value? They took their ability to build uh, fighter aircraft and bombers and said, we're going to go into the commercial business and build two commercial jets. Originally, it was the 880, and then there was a version called the 990. Well, they had the money, they certainly had the technological capability, and they had alignment in the organization. 
up and down about what they wanted to do about the strategy. What they lacked was the first component, a true sense of what the market conditions were over there. And they're markedly different in the defense industry. The way customers come to market to buy products and service and the way you go to market to sell products and services are vastly different. They misjudge that. Now, was it a good idea, poorly executed, or was it doomed from the start because it didn't have the right marketing foundations? I think probably more the latter than the former. But there's two examples, one where it was seen as a structural change, an opportunity to make money, one where there was a clearly defined cycle, maybe not unlike where we're headed today, and what seemed like a very reasonable approach. We have the technology, we have the, the resources, we got the corporate alignment. It seemed like a very reasonable approach. It didn't work well. And I think it was Norm Augustine that uh, had the famous line about the, uh, the record of success of defense companies getting into the commercial space is almost unblemished, or the record is almost unblemished by success, something like that. So there are lessons in both directions. And that's really the essence of, of the, uh, the discussion we're going to have this afternoon, that you need all three components to be successful. Well, let's go back to your original question. What kind of situation do we see ourselves in now? Inherently, this industry uh, provides one critical problem. Any business plan has to have a demand model, and then everything is built off of that demand model. History has shown that we're very good at seeing these cycles after the fact. Very difficult to predict that people like Saddam Hussein was going to invade Kuwait. Uh, you may, it's kind of like an earthquake, what's happening in Egypt now. You saw the tension building, you know something's got to happen eventually, but when, how, where, and at what magnitude, almost impossible to predict. So that level of uncertainty in our industry, um, I think will continue for a while. I think it's fair to say with the economic environment, the political rhetoric, we're clearly at an apex of spending in the longest run up that we've seen. Uh, in my mind, that does not mean that we are without opportunity as an industry uh, to continue to have uh, create shareholder value. Uh, you ask how, I think we'll follow the traditional uh, rules of making sure uh, what a good cyclical does and it makes sure that it can execute on its backlog. We'll do the right things to size the business appropriately, shed excess capacity and assets, but we will also look uh, both organically and through deployment of capital, acquisitions as you say, to grow the business. We'll grow it in our core and we'll grow it into uh, some, some near adjacencies. We leverage their talents, skills, technologies, and innovation. And in some cases, we've even acquired some of those unique talents, skills, uh, and, and brought them in-house uh, because we wanted to apply them more broadly. And the key is if you have that kind of innovative model in a large enterprise, how do you preserve what's created value for them and that, that engine of innovation and it just doesn't get sucked into the, you know, the broader operating uh, practices of a big platform company. A few years back, we acquired a company uh, that was actually started by two cognitive psychologists at CMU. Now, one may not see the direct correlation of, of these gentlemen to uh, the defense industry, but they were dealing eventually in their business with what they called uh, making the complex simple. And a particular problem that they had lit upon was this information flow. As we move an internet-like capacity to the battle space, you have a commander like any other business manager who is getting information about competitors, and in the case of the military, about the enemy, where your assets are, what strategies you want to de deploy or develop and how you want to deploy your assets now to counter competition or the threat. So they took a commercial model and they said, we're getting this information. How, do I, how does a human being want to process it? And they were looking at particular problems in the military battle space. And they were also applying it to other problems like energy management in buildings, to transportation solutions uh, for big transport companies around the world think of big logistics firms, I won't mention the names, but uh, they were clients. And it was how to simplify and manage the complex, and they were looking at this information problem. We thought it had great applications to some things that we knew were a problem in a domain we had some expertise with, our customers, the military customer. We put the two together, and we did it in such a fashion that we left 
a kernel, a development kernel here. We put the business around it, a business wrapper, preserve them from the usual vagaries of reporting out on a monthly basis. We left that to our traditional business guys. And then we use that kernel to uh, foster innovation and development in, in some other areas. Uh, it's been very, very productive for us. It's a company called MayaViz um, out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, I think we talked a little bit about the business environment. Uh, we've had the opportunity over the last 20 years to uh, go through some pretty large cycles. We had the procurement holidays of, of the 90s where this company shed a lot of excess assets and an opportunity we thought to create some value for our shareholders. Um, and then from the late 90s through the present day, we've uh, built the organization organically and through about Ooh, f over 50 acquisitions. So we see opportunity on both the down cycle and the up cycle to create value for um, not only our shareholders, but the other two stakeholders that we have, employees and our customers, and continue to do that. So we think that defense will be uh, a good market uh, to stay in for a while. We've diversified the portfolio uh, tremendously in the last 15 years. I think that puts us in as good a position as everyone. All portfolios have strengths and weaknesses, uh, no doubt ours does as well, but we've also got significant exposure to commercial aerospace, which I think puts us in, in good stead to balance that portfolio a little bit. Well, uh, we are always opportunistic, as I said, uh, last 15 years or so, we've done 50 plus acquisitions, so we're gonna continue to be opportunistic where we think we can create value uh, for our enterprise. Um, it, it's interesting, there's a little bit of a discontinuity right now between private valuations and public valuations. Uh, we see private equity entering the market again uh, to a large extent. So that'll sort itself out over time. And, uh, you know, you look back to the, the 90s, there were consolidators and, and there were liquidators. And I, I think eventually, uh, as the market trims down, it's a law of supply and demand. If there's excess capacity, the market will eventually sort itself out.